In a world where countless UFO sightings spark intrigue and debate, one man stands out, claiming not only to have seen them, but to have handled them in a secret facility near the notorious Area 51. Bob Lazar, a physicist, was allegedly exposed to the Pentagon's reverse engineering of alien spacecraft, witnessing gravity propulsion and antimatter reactors far beyond our current technology. Though once ridiculed by the U.S. government, recent revelations confirm Area 51's existence and suggest that UFOs might indeed be made of metamaterials, the stuff of the impossible. So, what other secrets did Bob Lazar reveal? In May of 1989, a self-proclaimed government whistleblower came to national media attention following a sensational interview. Using the pseudonym Dennis, the informant sat down with investigative reporter George Knapp to share his story with KLAS, a television station out of Las Vegas, Nevada, which obscured his face to keep his true identity a secret. According to Dennis, he was taking a grave risk, breaking his security oaths to speak with Knapp, which may have even endangered his life. Now, since then, the story of Dennis, whose true name was Robert Scott Lazar, has become something of a modern myth, debated in modern conspiracy culture. If his claims have any truth whatsoever, then what Bob Lazar has to share may well be the most important disclosure humankind has ever witnessed. Before we embark on the saga of Bob, we should acknowledge a few things. Much has been said, written, and debated regarding what Bob has revealed over the years. It isn't that his claims have simply met rebuttals. Every rebuttal has a rebuttal, every claim and a counterclaim, every inconsistency an advocate charging to Bob's defense. Even the version retold here might have inconsistencies from other versions of the story that Lazar once shared. Short of presenting a six-hour video, we can't possibly cover everything, so please don't comment down below that you forgot X, Y, and Z. We're just trying to give you a focused, summarized version that relies on the primary facts of what he revealed, their implications, and whether or not these claims have any real merit. Even the basic facts of his early life have come under fire, including his actual name and the circumstances of his birth. Most people accept that Bob Lazar was born on January 26th in 1959 in Florida. By all appearances, he was always interested in taking risks and experimenting with forms of propulsion even claiming to design a jet-powered bicycle when only a boy. According to Bob, this interest eventually inspired him to obtain not one, but two separate master's degrees, one in physics from MIT and one in electronics from Caltech. Bob claimed his earliest position of prestige was as a physicist at Los Alamos Mison Physics Facility. While working here, journalist Terry England interviewed Bob in 1982 for the Los Alamos monitor. Bob had designed, of all things, a jet power car with a top speed of 200 miles per hour. However, even this miraculous invention pales in comparison to what Bob Lazar would become most famous for. For some reason, by 1988, Bob no longer worked in physics, instead finding employment as the owner of a small photo development business operated just out of his home. Just shy of 30 years old, Bob began sending out resumes including one to famed physicist, presidential consultant, and father of the hydrogen bomb, Edward Teller. Teller actually knew Bob, who'd come to the former's attention after his jet car made the news. Now, to his surprise, Teller called Bob back and said that, well, he was only working as a consultant nowadays, he had led on an opportunity that Bob might find interesting. It would change his life. Teller provided Bob with a name and number to call, although Bob eventually lost the name and couldn't recall it in subsequent interviews. At the time, 
time he dialed the number and indeed received a call back from EG&G, a sizable government contractor specializing in advanced technology with several contracts in Nevada, of all places. At first, they told Bob he was overqualified. One or two days later, however, he was invited to participate in a job studying propulsion for the United States military. Beyond those vague details, Bob knew very little, and all that was about to change. After another interview that suggested the position might be part-time, Bob was finally invited to a secret rendezvous at the EG&G building in late 1988, or early 89, at McCarran International Airport, Harry Reid International today. Here, he met security officer Dennis Mariani, whose first name Bob would later appropriate for his interview with George Knapp. From there, Bob was then escorted onto an airplane and flown out to a top secret government facility deep in the Nevada desert. After that, he was transported for half an hour along a dusty gravel road aboard a bus with its windows blacked out to a second base. He would later discover that this facility was designated S-4. It was here that Bob would fill out reams of paperwork, basically signing his life away, sworn to secrecy and authorizing extensive monitoring of his activities, including permission to tap his personal phone. Before taking his position, Bob was also subjected to extensive physical exams and tests, monitoring allergic reactions to undisclosed substances. You remember that secret facility Bob was flown to before reaching S4. It was none other than Groom Lake, Area 51. Yes, folks, Bob Lazar was tasked with examining extraterrestrial technology with the purpose of reverse engineering it for human use. However, Bob's primary job site was not Area 51, but rather a satellite location near Papoose Lake to the south. According to Bob, S-4 included aircraft hangars built into the mountainside and was extremely secretive oppressive even. He could speak with no one outside of the team he was assigned to. Armed guards attended bathroom breaks, leading to many awkward conversations, I'm sure. Extensive screening measures at the entrance, including sensitive scales, prevented any secret material from being smuggled in or out. And Bob claimed that during his employment, he visited S-4 six or seven times to examine the nine extraterrestrial craft held there. He was read in on at least three projects. Project Sidekick, developing a beam weapon based on craft. Project Looking Glass, dedicated to seeing other points on our timeline other than the present. And Project Galileo, the reverse engineering propulsion of the craft to which he was tasked. Now, according to Bob, each flying saucer stood around 15 feet tall with a diameter somewhere around 35 to 40 feet across. All their exteriors lacked right angles or corners, given the impression that they had been somehow molded out of gray, pewter-like metal. The surface of the craft could take on a window-like transparency under very specific conditions. Initially, Bob suspected that the craft were man-made, leading him to conclude that terrestrial technology was responsible for UFO sightings. However, during his briefings, it soon became apparent that these ships were not of this earth. Bob, a lifetime car enthusiast, spent most of his time examining what he dubbed the sports model. Of three levels inside, Bob was permitted to access the lower two. On hands and knees, he would crawl to the bottom floors, and in his autobiography, Dreamland, Bob said this, On that lowest level, I saw three seats, similarly looking as if they had been part of the molding process and not manufactured separately and then affixed somehow to the rest of the structure. They reminded me of a Scandinavian chair without legs, looking very much like a rounded flower petal, more cupped than a tulips, but nearly so. Just as the hangar had been lit so that we could see the craft's interior, so was the interior. The material only dimly reflected the lights, as if it had a kind of matte finish to it, but its color didn't appear to be layered on. Rather, it was integral to the material itself. Integral and integrated were the two words that kept springing to mind. Whoever had designed and built this craft seemed to have no concern for aesthetics, 
at least not human aesthetics. The setup Bob described included no visible interface. On the level above, Bob discovered elements of the propulsion system, which he claimed to have also seen in the S4 laboratories. It seemed as though the craft was able to control antimatter and gravity itself. And on at least one occasion, Bob claims to have seen a brief demonstration of these capabilities. He said, at first I heard, rather than saw any activity coming from the craft, a loud hiss. Nothing painful, but the kind of buzzing sound that an electric substation might produce reached my ears. Then, the craft lifted up off the ground slightly wobbling, the central axis tilting a few degrees from vertical. As it lifted off, I could see the blue glow of a corona discharge coming from the bottom of the craft. That led me to believe that the air around the bottom of the craft where we suspected the emitter was, was being broken down and photons were being emitted. The light was visible, just as lightning in the sky is, due to that incredible high energy output. As the craft rose, the slight oscillations lessened and the hiss diminished. By the time it was 30 to 40 feet in the air, lifting nearly perfectly straight up, the sound was completely gone. In all my years of working with jet engines and pyrotechnics, I was accustomed to hearing loud noises as objects were being propelled upward or forward. The silence was eerily exciting, and I felt a broad grin spreading across my face. After a few moments of hovering in place, the craft descended and settled, reversing the process of moving from a stable orientation to a wobbling one before coming to rest. One important question lingered in Bob's mind. Who built this vehicle, and where had they come from? And to that end, he was able to read more than a hundred documents describing not only the way that the craft functioned, but the nature of its designers. According to Bob, the extraterrestrials responsible for building these vehicles hailed from the Zeta Reticuli binary star system, a location nearly 40 light years from Earth. This, however, is not even the most unsettling part of what Bob learned. These documents disclosed extraterrestrial involvement in human evolution, an endeavor achieved through selectively applied retroviruses and genetic manipulation. These interventions unfolded over the course of 65 interactions spanning 10,000 years. Along the way, the aliens gifted human beings with religion to provide a reason for us to not destroy ourselves. Exactly why the aliens care so much about humanity was not made specific. The most Bob learned is that they view us as containers of some sort, perhaps for soul energy. Their best chances of manipulating us occur during the times of rest, including sleep, which might explain why so many alien abductions occur under the cover of darkness. According to the documents, an exchange of hardware and intel between Earth and this other civilization had continued until 1979, when some undisclosed conflict occurred. Perhaps this was caused by the famous underground war at Dulce Base, if such a thing ever happened happened. That, or they saw the direction that fashion was headed in the 80s and just noped right out of our own solar system. Following 1979, all contact was cut off. Although authorities anticipated the return of the Zeta Reticulans sometime in the near future, it was at this point that the reverse engineering program began in earnest. A question that Bob has been asked many times over the years is whether or not he actually saw any aliens himself. His story has changed changed over time. Sometimes he says he has seen photographs of bodies, including autopsy photos, though he admits these might have simply entailed disinformation handed down from his employers. The account most often told finds Bob being escorted down the hallways of S4. As they pass one room, he catches something through the window out of the corner of his eye. A short figure standing between two men in lab coats. The figures have their backs to the window as they stare at a console of some sort. The fleeting impression leaves Bob with the sense that it might be a gray alien, similar to the kind shown in photos photographs during briefings. Since first sharing the story, Bob admits that it might have been a doll or a mannequin, perhaps placed to test him somehow. In any case, Bob's handler pushed him along the corridor, commanding him to keep his eyes forward. 
Bob claims that he was brought on board at S4 to replace a technician who had died while attempting to disassemble one of the craft's reactors. While he was thrilled to be working on the project, the infrequency of his visits often left him frustrated. He was eager to learn more, an enthusiasm that made it difficult to not share his knowledge with others. In March of 1989, he began taking associates Gene Huff and John Lear to a position on public land where they could watch a test flight of the craft above the desert. On their first outing, all three observed a saucer-shaped object through their telescope. On March 29th, Bob and his companions took a second trip, this time hoping to catch the phenomenon on film. They succeeded, though the footage only shows a bright light spinning off into the mountains. A third trip would prove their last. Law enforcement not only chased them off the land, but shared their identities with authorities. Bob's security clearance was revoked, and his employment at S4 was terminated. This is the most concise summary of Bob Lazar's story. Ufologists have debated the tale ad nauseum ever since, with factions aligning into camps who believe and those who think it's all fake. While there are plenty of compelling aspects to Bob's account, it's impossible not to see some glaring problems. The first thing that springs to mind is how, despite the sensitivity of his job, Bob's handlers seem relatively laid back about security. If they were having a chat with an alien, why didn't they cover the windows? Why did they fail to secure an area of the desert where the craft could be observed? Perhaps most obvious Obviously, if this secret is so important that Bob feared for his life, why is he still alive at all? The American Southwest is vast and undoubtedly marked by dozens, if not hundreds or thousands, of unmarked graves holding murder victims and people too problematic to be left alive. Yet, the most physical aggression that the government has ever shown towards Bob Lazar has been running him off the road, smashing his car window, and shooting at his tires. Not exactly efficient wet work. Bob claimed that he feared for his life so much that he ended up carrying an Uzi submachine gun in his vehicle for protection. But did these half-hearted attacks really warrant such paranoia? More specifically, Bob's story really falls apart when looking at the trail of records he must have left behind. If this story is to be believed, Caltech and MIT have no record of Bob Lazar's attendance and his high school performance and his bottom third of his class seems far below the standards of either institution. Even if they were somehow forced to wipe his record, as Bob sometimes claims, certainly a classmate from either college would have stepped forward by now to confirm his attendance. No one has. In fact, when asked to provide the name of a professor at Caltech, Bob offered Bill Duxler. Ufologist Stanton Friedman followed up this lead, only to discover that Dr. Duxler never taught at Caltech. While he was a physics professor, he taught at Pierce Junior College. In a surprising twist, this institution does have a record of Bob Lazar's attendance during the exact same time frame he claimed to have attended at MIT. Hmm. There's also a lack of documentation surrounding Bob's work history. Despite claiming that he was a physicist at Los Alamos, the only hint of Bob's employment there is a technician for a contractor firm. Otherwise, the facility has no further records, nor does EG&G, the contractor who supposedly hired him to work at S4. But what about the descriptions of the craft? Does anything about them raise a red flag? Well, as it just so happens, Bob's description of the sport model closely resembles the flying saucers seen in the photographs from Billy Meyer, a UFO contactee who many, if not most ufologists, regard as a fraud. The surface of the craft strongly resembles the ship seen in the 1968 Cold War science fiction film, The Bamboo saucer. It seems as if Bob might have drawn inspiration from another film. Since he first shared his story, Bob has mentioned a highly sophisticated hand skinning device used to gain entry into classified areas. Filmmaker Jeremy Corbel later uncovered evidence that such technology was indeed in place at secure locations in the 1980s. This, Bob's supporters claimed, was the smoking gun proving his authenticity. However, they failed to appreciate two details here. Not only was this technology public knowledge from the early 1970s onward, it was trademarked as the Identimat. But 
it was also featured in the 1977 film Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Just as in Bob's story, the hand scanner was used to gain access to a top-secret government facility in a film about UFOs, no less. Bob was also not the first person to mention Area 51, as many of his supporters claim. Even his UFO footage and claimed observation of test flights remain inconclusive, as he could have easily been seeing early drone technology. Or not so early. Drone technology actually stretches back to World War II when the British deployed a radio-controlled craft known as the Aerial Target. So, does this mean that Mr. Lazar is a fraud? Not quite. After all, no one really disputes his natural intelligence or technical skills. I mean, for all we know, he is telling the truth, and his record has been expunged by government agents seeking to control the UFO secret. In this scenario, killing Bob would only confirm his story. Better to let him live in ridicule. There is also the possibility that Bob has been telling the truth this entire time, but was himself a victim. After all, George Knapp maintains Bob's credibility to this day based on his intimate and accurate knowledge of the Groom Lake facility, including such details as the location of the canteen and how meals were paid for, which Knapp verified through his own contacts. What scenarios can we construct out of this possibility? Perhaps Lazar was being fed disinformation in some capacity and simply embellishing the bits about the actual craft. We all knew that kid from school. You know, the My Uncle Works at Nintendo, and he says that Raiden will be a playable character in the next Super Smash Brothers. Or maybe Bob himself is the disinformation agent. In 1990, UFO and conspiracy investigator Norio Hayakawa interviewed Bob Lazar and noted that curious characters seemed to shadow him the entire time, leading to speculation that these were, in fact, handlers assigned to make sure Bob stayed on script, whatever that script may be. There are also indications that Bob was subjected to regular tests monitoring his health and vital signs. Was this the actual goal? Was he being subjected to some sort of weapon, chemical, or biological? biological agent or psychological tests. Was he essentially a guinea pig? We'll return to more of Bob's claims and his past in just a moment. Now, in the meantime, is there anyone else who might provide supporting evidence for his claims? There is one man, David Adair, who was something of an engineering prodigy in his teens and was the recipient of the Air Force's highest science award when he was just 17 years old. Writing for the Los Angeles Times, a Roger K. Lear said that Adair built a nuclear fusion electromagnetic containment engine. This rocket was tested successfully and had an eventful landing in that land beyond lands that doesn't exist, the famous Area 51. It was this 1971 landing that, according to David, actually granted him access to Area 51. David had already caught the attention of the government. His mother was the caretaker of the parents of a high-ranking military official, and his inventions had caused a minor sensation in the rocketry field. When his engine crashed at Area 51, he at first thought he was simply being escorted to retrieve his rocket. In reality, he was about to see something that would forever change his life. David climbed aboard an immense elevator that lowered him into a cavern underground space, so large that it could accommodate more than a hundred Boeing 747 jumbo jets. The ceiling was so high that it vanished out of sight above him. After coming to an abrupt stop, David claimed that he was then escorted past a variety of aircraft, some of which he recognized, some of which were completely foreign to his eyes. The Air Force then allowed David to examine a bus-sized device he referred to as a novel fusion engine. He said that if his own engine could be compared to a Model A Ford, this would be the equivalent of a Dodge Viper. The young prodigy had never seen anything like this in his life. It was clearly not produced on Earth, but instead fashioned in deep space by non-human intelligences. He said that it showed no seams, was made of organic and inorganic components, and seemed to possess its own sentience. In fact, it reacted to his touch. Even the military itself could not understand what it was or how it functioned, hence the desperation that led them to enlist the help of such a young, vulnerable man. David asked where the rest of the ship was, but received no answer. The officials did... However, 
permit him access to a damaged area inside the engine. In a 2002 interview, he said this, They told me to make it brief, so I got down and looked in the area. Man, there was some incredibly looking technology up and down this engine, and I couldn't get more than three feet into it before I came to a wall. And this wall, it was like the iris or shutter on a camera lens. It had lots of interlocking fans that contract or expand. I just put my hand on it, and when I did, the wall just shuttered open. I got to look deep deeper into the engine, and what I saw in there was fascinating. It was such a trip being there because whenever I worked on my fusion engines, everything was so small. Some parts I even had to machine under a microscope. Now, here was a replication of my basic design that was big enough to walk through. But man, this thing, what I had manufactured to achieve a certain function in my engine, this thing would have something else in its place. And this something else would be stuff I couldn't begin to recognize. There were these crystals that were facing each other. They were fabulous looking crystals and they were integrated into this plasma duct type thing. This thing had some kind of venting system that allowed them to flush their plasma out through an area that looked like the gills of a shark. The whole thing was so organic looking. I don't think I was in there more than five minutes. I know that doesn't sound like a very long time, but it felt like I was in there for a week. It is worth noting that David's track record is a lot clearer and a lot less spotty than Lazar. At age 19, he revolutionized the way that the U.S. Navy changed jet turbine engines with a state-of-the-art mechanical system. As of 2002, the turnaround times still held the world record for being the fastest. Later in life, David Adair would go on to become president of Intersect, Inc. and consult for such organizations as Edison Electric, R.J. Reynolds, Union Electric Company, and the United States Army Air Force and Navy. But David Adair is just one of many engineers who, along with Lazar, claim to have seen or worked on extraterrestrial spacecraft. The association between captured alien vehicles and Area 51 has a long and storied history, stretching all the way back to the alleged 1947 flying saucer crash in Roswell, New Mexico, after which debris was supposedly transferred to various locations before arriving at the secret site. Since then, People regularly see strange lights and objects in the vicinity over Area 51, continuing to fuel rumors that either the military is flying craft or that they have successfully reverse-engineered alien technology for their own use, just as Lazar claimed he was tasked with doing. Other, more sinister stories have emerged over the years. In 1974, the secret program operation often was moved from CIA headquarters into Virginia to none other than Area 51. Unlike other endeavors allegedly housed there, Operation often was not focused on extraterrestrial life, but rather practices best described as occult, black magic, hexes, curses, even mind control. To this day, the files surrounding Operation often remain classified, begging the question as to how successful they truly were. I mean, certainly there's nothing to hide if it was a failure. However, recent evidence has come to light that Operation often did succeed in one significant way. After contacting several prominent demonologists, they managed to summon a dark entity from the depths of time, one of the sub-princes of hell. The name of this eldritch abomination was Subbaro, and today he still causes pain and suffering among those who dare to eat his pizza. <laughs> Don't worry, though. The Stromboli's safe. Operation Often was the brainchild of Dr. Sidney Gottlieb, who once led the Chemical Division of the Chemical Intelligent Agency's Technical Services staff. Gottlieb maintained a working relationship with none other than Edward Teller, the very physicist who enlisted Lazar in the first place. One of the most controversial theories surrounding the secrecy at Area 51 comes from researcher and author Nick Redfern, who through extensive research and application of FOIA releases, came to a startling conclusion. It might even be more horrific than the idea of black magic or flying saucers at Area 51. As recently as this year, Redfern summarized his book Body Snatchers in the Desert by saying this, The overwhelming secrecy was due to the fact that certain controversy-filled packs had secretly been put into place. They were designed to allow a large number of German and Japanese 
Chinese scientist to avoid prosecution for their Second World War era war crimes. Instead, those scientists secretly went to work for the U.S. government, and that included working on the craft that crashed to the Earth outside of Roswell, New Mexico, and which led to the infamous legend of the UFO crash. Some of those craft were actually piloted. Others had human guinea pigs on board, handicapped people who were strapped into gondolas and lifted high into the sky by huge balloon arrays, chiefly to further expand the scope of controversial work in the field of high-altitude exposure and early rocketry. In other words, had the truth of Roswell surfaced back then, the floodgates would almost certainly have opened wide and the sinister treaty with ardent Nazis and crazed Japanese scientists who all had no qualms at all about using innocent people with ardent Nazis and crazed Japanese scientists who had no qualms at all about using innocent people in nightmarish experiments would have reared its ugly head. This interpretation was supported by the work of journalist Annie Jacobson who in 2011 heard that there were no aliens involved in the Roswell crash but rather human beings. Jacobson said, the people, according to the source, were child-sized pilots, and there's a lot of debate about how old they were. The source believes they were 13, although other people believe they may have been older. I believe it was important that I put this information out there because it is the tip of a very large iceberg. Jacobson disagrees with Redfern's assessment that the craft that crashed at Roswell was from the United States. However, she said, the child-sized aviators in this craft the one that crashed into New Mexico, were the result of a Soviet human experimentation program, and they had been made to look like aliens. The plan, according to my source, was to create panic in the United States with this belief that a UFO had landed with aliens inside of it. In any case, Jacobson's book, Area 51, An Uncensored History of America's Top Secret Military Base, clearly shows a history of ethical malpractice around the installation, including officials commanding personnel to drive through nuclear bomb tests only an hour after detonation. For the sake of argument, let's say that all these alternative theories are inaccurate. Let's say that Bob Lazar was indeed tasked with reverse engineering extraterrestrial vehicles. If so, what are the best claims Bob has made to verify his authenticity? By far the most popular Proof that Bob Lazar is genuine is the existence of Element 115. He has claimed since 1989 that no more than 223 grams of the copper orange fuel could power an extraterrestrial craft's anti-gravity engine. When Bob first claimed its existence, there was no Element 115 on the periodic table. Today, that position has been held by the synthetic radioactive element Mascovium since 2015. The fact that Bob predicted its discovery seems to suggest that he was telling the truth all along, right? Well, as of 2023, the highest atomic number on the periodic table is 118. I'm gonna make a prediction, Lurklings. If our technology progresses enough, one day we will discover element 119. Now, how can I make such a bold statement, you ask? Simple. The atomic number of each element describes the number of protons in the nucleus of an atom of that element. Scientists are always trying to synthesize elements with even higher atomic numbers. While research has currently stalled at synthesizing anything higher than 118, given the right technology, it remains feasible. Now, in some regards, the creation of elements with higher atomic numbers is just a matter of time. The question was never whether or not we would discover an element 115, but rather whether or not Bob Lazar accurately described element 115's qualities. So, did he accurately predict those? Well, not really. Bob said that element 115 could not be synthesized in a lab. It could only be obtained by harvesting deposits from high mass star systems. Unfortunately for Bob, it was synthesized in a lab in 2003. He also claimed that it could be stabilized, but since only heavy elements with an even number of protons can be stabilized, this is unlikely to ever happen, since element 115 has an odd number of protons. That is, unless we upend everything we know about chemistry. To the contrary, Moscovium is highly unstable, with a half-life of just 0.65 seconds. Interestingly, an article in Scientific American theorized an island of stability around heavy elements like element 114, which might have inspired Bob's claim about element 
Amendment 115. The article's publication date suggests this was the case. It dropped in May of 1989, the same month of Bob's first interview with George Knapp. I mean, for years, Bob Lazar has claimed that he smuggled some of this material out of the laboratory as sort of an insurance policy. He has never shown it to the public, raising questions of whether or not he has ever had any in the first place. After all, it seems like the elaborate screening measures mentioned earlier at S4 would have intercepted such contraband. One of the few people who might have seen Bob Lazar's Element 115 is Robert Bigelow, American gigolo entrepreneur. No, just kidding. After creating a company together called the Zeta Reticuli Corporation, one Bob showed the other Bob his sample of stable element 115. According to ufologist Jacques Vallée, Lazar exhibited a substance that was light, foam-like, and almost weightless, hinting it would revolutionize energy and propulsion. The cooperation only lasted until the day when Bigelow noticed a container of Lazar's secret sauce in a corner and recognized it as a commercial emulsive product. In other words, the fabled element Bob Lazar showed Bob Bigelow was nothing more than a piece of common industrial insulator foam. If I ever get the chance to make a Pokemon, I'm naming it Bob Lazar. 150 bullcrap attack damage to any benched Pokemon. All this controversy has not discouraged Bob Lazar's supporters, however, who claim that a raid on his apartment in 2017 was nothing short of an attempt to retrieve the sample that Bob stole from the US government. In reality, it was because law enforcement suspected that Bob Lazar's scientific supply store, United Nuclear Scientific, might have provided the thallium involved in a murder in Michigan. Although Bob was not listed as a suspect in the investigation, this was not the first time that he had run afoul of the law. In 2003, another raid on United Nuclear led to Bob and his wife, Joy White, being charged with violating the Federal Hazardous Substances Act. The company pleaded guilty in 2006 to three criminal counts involving the introduction of banned hazardous substances into interstate commerce. The following year, a $7,500 fine was leveled at United Nuclear for violating laws surrounding fireworks. As it turns out, Lazar's history with the law goes even further back. 1990 saw Bob convicted of felony pandering, a reduction after being arrested for aiding and abetting a prostitution ring. During the course of the investigation, Bob revealed several aliases for his first wife, Carol. Completely normal, right? I mean, what? Your ex doesn't have multiple aliases? Maybe you should start checking her Instagram more often. Bob Lazar's first wife, Carol, passed away in 86. While the name on their marriage certificate reads Carol Nadine Strong, Bob mentioned the last name Esslinger taken from an old boyfriend's aunt. Why would she change her name? As it turns out, on June 12, 1974, Carol, Gary Burkett, and Gary's wife Victoria entered the home of Dennis Pissarro. When they emerged, Dennis was dead. You see, Gary was a member of the infamous Hells Angels Motorcycle Club and had a disagreement with Dennis. While Carol held a house guest of Dennis's at gunpoint, Gary and Victoria stabbed and fatally shot Dennis. Before they left, they handcuffed Dennis's house guest to a shelf and had him inject himself with some sort of substance to incapacitate him for their getaway. Although the man survived, this was only because he injected the smallest amount of whatever was in the syringe. Even that tiny bit necessitated surgery down the road. Eventually, Carol Esslinger, or Strong, or whatever you want to call her, Bob Lazar's future wife, was charged with second-degree murder, conspiracy, and false imprisonment. She would spend two and a half years in prison before her release in November of 77. To be clear, this story doesn't directly implicate Lazar at all. Maybe when he married Carol, he was giving her exactly what she needed a second chance. When held up against his later involvement in hazardous substances, prostitution, and another murder case, it does call into question his credibility. A case could be made that Lazar was involved in shady activities long before ever catapulting to stardom as ufology's greatest whistleblower. Ask yourself, does this seem like a man who can be trusted, especially in light of such fantastic claims? Lazar's story has met with pitfalls and skepticism, as well as authority and respect. 
expect. What is really true remains a mystery. Did Lazar actually work on extraterrestrial spacecraft, or does his affiliation with the criminal underbelly suggest a mere opportunist seizing upon the UFO hysteria of the later 80s and early 90s? As far as Area 51, an abundance of evidence suggests something there is kept secret. Whether or not this is terrestrial or extraterrestrial, in nature is anyone's guess. Either way, the technology reported in the desert sky around the Groom Lake area certainly seems exotic enough to entertain the alien possibility. There are secrets there, secrets that the United States government has no interest in sharing, yet our attention is constantly being drawn to this remote location. We just can't help it. With so many eyes on the skies, maybe that is the true reason why the Bob Lazar story took hold. I mean, after all, what better candidate would be there to carry this fantastic story ahead other than this meek, unassuming genius with a shady past and spotty history. He, just like the facility in which he worked, remains a mystery. I think we would all agree that this is exactly how they want it to remain. And lastly, I would love to give a huge shout out to Miguel Red Pill Junkie Romero for his help in putting together this script and all the information within it. Thank you. And more importantly, I want to know what you guys think, so be sure to leave your comments down below. I would love to hear them. And if you guys enjoyed today's episode, be sure to go ahead and smack that like and subscribe button for more content just like this. As always, guys, I love you all. Keep an open mind, and I'll see you guys in the very next episode.